Hello. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Only one of you, Michelle, you brought the tea. I know. We were Johannes asked. didn't bring the tea. Okay. I didn't bring my tea. <laughs> Johannes is not a team player. We were asked to bring the tea with us for a comfy look. <laughs> and you didn't. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to Nice Tuesdays. Um, thank how you for are you doing? Good thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wonderful to be in London. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so you're over for how long? You've been here for like about ten days or something. Well, you have been a bit longer, right, Johannes? Yeah, I've been here for about a week. I okay. saw some art shows. London is so nice. It's so nice <laughs> to be here. Actually, like, <laughs> want to move back to London? <laughs> I want to move back. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we will welcome so. you back with, with open arms Aww. if you do decide to do that. Um, it's quite nice like, hearing how great you found London. I feel like you know, we could all do with a bit of that, to be honest, uh, us Londoners. Let us know if um, anyone's got a job for us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, well, let's start, I guess, and let's start at the beginning. Um, I'm really keen to know how you, you met and how your kind of collaboration began, how you first started working together as Studio Yukiko. Uh, we studied at Brighton University, um, different courses, and then we met actually afterwards. Um, we started dating. <laughs> it's quite a personal <laughs> question to start. I can't believe to. you're telling <laughs> everyone. To me. I don't really know how else to phrase that. You said it was an um, open <laughs> secret, but that's in the first <laughs> answer. <laughs> it's not much of a secret anymore. Um, um, no, we were working at different agencies. Um, in Brighton and in London, and I think we really wanted to do something. Uh, they were good agencies, but we really wanted to explore a little bit our own creativity. You know, we were still young. Um, we're still young now. We're still young. <laughs> <laughs> we're less young. Um, Johannes uh, had spent 10 years in London, as uh, from Germany, so he was quite keen to go back to Germany. And um, yeah, I was up for Berlin, so we went. Um, I guess we have, everyone will, will see behind us that your work, your amazing work is going to be um, in a slideshow behind us, but um, I guess people will have recognized a lot of it, but yeah, it's kind of going to be whirring away behind us. Um, I guess was there one particular project either early on or at some point in, in the kind of studio's early days that you felt kind of took you to a different level as a studio? Um, or do you feel like it's just kind of grown very steadily, kind of incrementally over the years? What, what, how would you describe the kind of growth? Um, I think, shall I take this? Yeah. Go for it. I think um, there's one, I think when we started off, we were in this really uh, run-down old swimming pool, um, and that was our, our studio, it was called Stadtbad, and actually Boiler Room had their, their um, parties downstairs in the actual boiler room of the, of the swimming pool, which was, it was such a good, good time. Very Berlin. Then, <laughs> very Berlin. Doing, yeah, very Berlin. But um, during that time, um, or during one of those parties, we met some people who were starting a magazine, and we sort of became friends with them. Well, actually, we kind of became best friends uh, during the process of uh, making this magazine. And this magazine was Flaneur, um, which deals with one street per issue, and it's a sort of a nomadic magazine in the way that we get to travel to a different um, city per issue. And we had this plan that we were going to make it like two every year or something. And now we're just, I don't one know. Every <laughs> one every two years. One every three years. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, I think, I think we were quite lucky to, to meet these, these like-minded creatives and, and to team up with them and, and, um, and create this project together. It kind of felt like a real team effort. And I think everyone was very serious about it. And I think you know, being together in this sort of like, almost like a band <laughs> that was traveling and performing almost like uh, in different cities. It, it felt like a communal thing. And it certainly gave us a lot of exposure. Um, and it was... I think nice, nice places like It's Nice that covered it. So that yeah. helped. <laughs> I remember, yeah. It was like 2013 or 2015, I think. I can't remember. But we, we wrote about the first, the first issue, yeah. I, we've been doing it for 10 years now, so... Yeah. And I guess when it came to setting up your own studio, um, what did you feel like the main kind of core tenets were of the studio that really you felt, I guess, set, set you apart from, you know, there's a lot of studios out there, but you've done something really unique. I guess what did you feel like right at the beginning was that core aspect that made you different? What was the unique thing that we did? <laughs> no, I, I think, I mean, Flaneur was, it was, 
it was good because we became known for it and we became known for working in quite a sort of experimental hands-on way, maybe. And I don't think we ever said we're going to start a studio now. I think it was a progressive thing. Um, we had a child, this gets really passing, and our sort of first intern became our senior designer really quickly. And then, you know, five years later, we're like 10 people. But um, I think the, the thing that makes us really Yukiko is just our team. Like, the, it's all their individual creative voices. They're, they're all super unique. You know, they all have something really to bring. And um, we've always tried to give them room uh, so that they could bring their best, you know. So. But I think it's also like the way we approach every project is um, kind of with a curious mind. Like I think that we don't, we don't need to know all the answers in before. And I think the kind of way of like discovery during the process is something that we, um, that happens. And I think, I think maybe one of the sort of like key aspects of, of, our, of our practices to just, yeah, just be be curious and, and always try new things out. I think that there was a lot of, even especially in the beginning, I think we didn't know much. I think like we had never, for example, the magazine, we, we were like, yeah, sure, we've done loads of magazines before we hadn't done any. <laughs> so we we're just, you know, just trying things out and just um, telling ourselves that we're, we can do it and, you know, um, learning from there. I mean, you've mentioned the Flaneur magazine, which I'd love to come on to. And um, I love the idea of kind of, yeah, fake it till you make it. Say, yeah, well, we've done tons of those magazines. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll be fine. Um, but I guess a big thing about that magazine is its kind of international aspect as well, right? You know, as you said, every issue goes to a, one particular street in one city around the world. And that is the focus of that issue of the magazine. Amazing idea for, for a magazine. But it's also something to do with Studio Yukiko as well. You have a very... I don't know, kind of cross-cultural or international, um, I guess, like viewpoint on things. Is that is that fair, Michelle? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that doing that magazine opened our eyes um, to sort of, you know, working a little bit more internationally. Um, I think it's more about... I think that kind of thing makes you realize your blind spots, if anything. Right. You know, we do have quite an international team, but we just know that we don't know everything and that, you know, if you're... Working sort of especially with other cultures or communities, you need to you need to bring the experts in, so to speak. But um, I mean, Zoom as well, like what just made everything very global very quickly yeah. as well. <laughs> you know. I mean, another thing is, I guess you also work with a lot of experts from outside of the graphic design field, right? Like, I know you've worked with architects and poets. Um, how do those collaborations work? And I guess what do you get out of them? You know, bringing quite unusual disciplines into, or different disciplines at least, into your work. Johannes? I mean, um, I think this is sort of like latching on to what I was saying before. I think like, I mean, <laughs> to fake it while you make it, I guess, doesn't apply here. But I think the fact that, you know, I think you or, or we, uh, we tend to be, I think we kind of um, need to make ourselves aware that we're not experts in everything, right? So I think like that we have to obviously tap into sort of a wider network of creatives who, who know what they're doing. But I think also just to kind of stay vulnerable and want to learn and continue to grow, grow yourself, I think means that you're, you're kind of open to, to tapping into this network and not just to pretend that you know all the answers. But I think um, generally, um, I think a collaboration for us, it always is like working with different clients, say, for example, a curator from, a, from an art show, you, you learn so much in the discussion between them, uh, between us. I mean, you, you kind of pick up on, on all the themes, for example, that this show is about. Or, for example, we just branded a, um, a, a pop uh, award for popular music, which is sort of the Brit Award, I guess, of Germany. And for, their, for, for this, we looked at sort of the whole DNA, the strategy, the mission or vision and values. We named it, we did the brand, visual branding. But then we also looked at the kind of core um, aspects of awarding music. And we, we teamed up with experts, mental health experts, to really discuss how, how to, like what are the kind of criteria of, of 
like talking about art or music in specific? And are there still, is it still relevant even to have an award? What, um, what are we awarding? Like there's no more best album. Who give, who, no one is even listening to that. So I think kind of in this process, you learn so much. I mean, I didn't, I mean, yeah, sure. Like I, I listen to music, <laughs> but I never, I'm not tapping into sort of this microcosm of a specific industry and just by working with um, a wider field of experts, you kind of learn so much and yeah, it's a real joy, those type of projects. I think, I think there's also something nice about collaboration where you, you have to uh, sort of have faith in letting go of your vision a little bit. It's like as soon as you bring other people in, you're giving away some of that control of the vision. But I think you have to have faith that like, it might just go somewhere that you didn't even imagine it could, you know, which is mostly nice. Yeah. <laughs> mostly nice, but also it can be a bit scary, right? I think like yeah. what I hear from you is that it's really, um, I guess you're putting yourselves in quite vulnerable positions, which, you know, that is what learning's all about, and you have to be very open to that. But, um, yeah, I can imagine it, when you've kind of established yourselves as a studio, it might be quite easy to do the same project over and over again, and people kind of come to you for very similar things. But it sounds like you kind of always want to push things in new directions, and um, I guess, yeah, that, that, that is a bit of a vulnerable thing, isn't it? I, I actually, I kind of... I don't think we really do the same project over and over again. Um, I think we're quite... We're quite restless in the way that we always take on projects that are wildly different. I mean, sure, um, often the format is similar, like say we work with a museum and br we brand a show um, visually, but often when it comes down to sort of the core creative ask or task, it's so different. Every, every time we have to map out a new set of rules and a new way, a new mechanic of approaching um, uh, the, the task. So I think, um, I, yeah, we never, I think it also comes kind of down from being, I don't know, maybe like just getting kind of bored quite easily. I think we're rare. <laughs> we're always on the hin hand for new challenges, I guess. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, it really shows in your, you know, when you look through all the projects that you've done, there's such variety there. I don't think there's any other studio I can think of that really does that breadth of stuff and kind of take such an experimental approach to it. I mean, we're, I guess like we're seeing a lot of your work behind us. I hope everyone will see as well. Like there's a lot of humor in your work, which I kind of wanted to come on to because it's something that's often missed, I think, in design that there is a, <laughs> why are you giving me that, that look? Are you nervous about talking about humor? <laughs> I'm just worried if he's going to crack a joke. I'm just going to get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I just want to read a couple of things from your, your website, which I'm assuming the pair of you have signed off on, but um, there's bits of copy like, release the tensions of deep-seated business problems with full-service visual wellness, and things like that, which is obviously meant to be funny, and you it is funny. Um, but yeah, what, I guess like, what role does humor play in your work? How much are you trying to bring humor into your work when the, when the right project, you know, fits the right project? I mean, I'm German, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I think it's just, it's about, I don't know, just not taking yourself that seriously, right? I mean, how many hours do you spend at work? You've got you've to have a bit of fun. Um, I think the other thing is maybe lowering sort of the expectations of clients. <laughs> like, a, you know... They, they might get something surprising, good or bad, um, that kind of approach. But yeah, it's, it's nothing too deep. It's just have a, have a laugh. I mean, does it, like if you're trying to have a laugh with, I mean, a serious question, like a client, certain clients probably wouldn't be that into that. How do you manage those relationships when you're trying to do something that's experimental and a bit fun? And I guess a client is not in, not in that you know, frame of mind, let's put it that way. Yeah, there's definitely um, time when it's appropriate and time when it's not. Like we didn't not. That's really hard for me, actually. I never know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when not to crack a joke. <laughs> no, I think we're we're quite lucky. I mean, we're, we. I mean, some clients are really up for it. The so we branded the restaurant for Camper, mm -hmm. and um. They're quite eccentric as a brand, you know, and that, and that was really nice. So we thought, well, we just, it's a restaurant, but they're an eccentric brand, so maybe we can do sort of an eccentric branding. 
Um, and the restaurant was called Kamalian, and then we, um, I don't know, came up with this really long-winded story about a chameleon who is having an existential crisis because, you know, he keeps ch changing his mood, and so he doesn't know who he is because it's a restaurant and you can, I don't, like, rest or have a business <laughs> meeting or something. And, but also he's really hungry. Um, so, um, so that was the pitch to the client, and they loved it, and they thought it was really cool. So we had really like sort of uh, lines about like mortality, or you know, sort of um, bre breaking the bread of life and things like this. But yeah, so it's like, you know, some clients like us. I think like, but it's a classic sort of like Yukiko approach, I guess, of just creating more corners. You know, some people cut corners; we create more corners in a way. Do we just bamboozle the clients in our presentation till they go, oh, um, Yeah, they're just so <laughs> irritated that they just go for it. <laughs> Not another corner, please. Just, please just, don't give us any more ideas. Just tell me where to sign, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, I mean, I guess another kind of similar thing, a similar question is about your style or your aesthetic as a studio. And I guess, you know, to a certain extent, you have to cater to the client, and there is, you know, often a client in your work. Um, but there is always something that makes them kind of recognizable as a Studio Yukiko project. Um, is that something you think about? Do you think, like, oh, this, you know, we'd love this to fit within our style or our aesthetic. We want it to feel like a project that we've done. Or are you very much just, like, does that come out naturally, and actually all you're trying to do is just focus on the client brief? Sorry, very long-winded question, but... Yeah, people say it to us a lot, oh, that's really Studio Yukiko. Mm. Or like, oh, we saw a poster and we didn't understand it, and then we found out you did it, and that made sense. And, you know, things like that. Um, I do wonder, when they say that, I do think about what that is. Um, it usually means it's either loud or it's grungy or something. Um, but uh, I don't know, it's, we're doing it, so of course it's going <laughs> to yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of your, I guess, your personal aesthetic, your personal taste that's coming through in the, in the work, do you think? Not really. I mean, to be honest, I think, so Yukiko is not just us. We're about 10, 10 other people in the studio. So it's everyone. Um, we're just representing <laughs> the, the founding partners of it, I guess. Oh, who are we? Um, but I think, I mean, sure. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of hands that work at Yukiko, so I think we have to acknowledge that. But I think also if you like follow the accounts of the designers who work there, they all have like really strong style, like their own really strong aesthetic. And like people who know us really well, they'll be like, oh, that's such an era project. Oh, I bet Seb did that, you know, that sort of thing, okay. which is really nice. It's really cool. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So it's kind of also about who you're bringing into the team, and you want people with that like strong aesthetic that doesn't look like other people's work. Well, totally, yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah. That's interesting. There's a question, an audience submitted question, which um, kind of covered that, which is like, what are you looking for from people who apply to, to the studio? And I guess that's, that's one thing, right? Like uh, a very unique look to their work. Yes, but don't over-design your CV. Okay. So, yeah. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> PDFs only, please. Leave it in the design. <laughs> Getting into the format, I like it. <laughs> um, I want to come on to like, specifically some of the projects now. And actually, you mentioned Flaneur magazine. I'd love to start there because, um, yeah, we wrote about issue one back in 2013, I've just read. Um, but I guess your, your magazine's kind of gone through nine issues, I think, at this point, nine editions. The latest one focused on uh, Boulevard Perifique, sorry, in, in Paris. I think that my favorite one was the one that focused on uh, Kangding uh, Road in, in Taipei. That was issue eight, I think. Can you just talk me through how you approached that issue? Because it's such an amazing looking magazine. Um, I'd love to know what the process was for kind of, yeah, for designing that one, art directing it. Um, so the, for that issue, we, um, Flaneur got a, resi a three month residency in Taipei. Um, we couldn't stay for three months, but the editors uh, did stay for three months and in the center in this little artist village. And we went and stayed for a few weeks. Um, and I mean, the, it, the magazine's about walking, so it's, that's, that's what we do, a lot, a lot of walking, um, really to get a sort of a, um, a feeling for the streets. And yeah, it's about sort of 
building up a network of artists, writers, thinkers, poets, you name it, you know, and everyone, all the contributors are local, everyone has usually a connection to the street or something like this. Um, and then we came back and then um, when the street had been chosen, we were a little bit further down the line, then we sent Seb for a little while to do more research, meet all the artists, this kind of thing. And then, I mean, that, it took like two years to produce this magazine. <laughs> I mean, when you're doing indie publications, it's, you know, you have to give people the time and the good working conditions, you know, to create these things. And we generally let the artists sort of, um, we, don't, we don't tell them what to do, you know, we let them find what interests them about the street and let them sort of um, do their own project. And then usually they sort of brief us a little bit uh, how to lay it out. But I mean, the, the general design is inspired, of course, by the light boxes and the general feeling of the streets, absolutely. And we worked with a Taiwanese designer in Berlin who happened to have grown up on the street and his grandmother still lives there, so that was, that was lovely. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I guess, like, do you, do you come home with, you know, thousands and thousands of photos of that street? Or, or I guess you didn't know necessarily it was that street, but yeah, and signage and all that kind of thing. And then going, you're kind of wading through it to, to come up with the art direction and design. Yes. <laughs> that is how it works, <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, it's interesting because I think, like, everyone here, I'm sure, is a real indie magazine fan and, you know, grew up reading great magazines, indie magazines, but it has been quite a tough time, it must be said, for the indie magazine world. Um, why do you still take on kind of magazine projects? And I know you still do um, quite a lot of print. Um, and yeah, I guess like, what's it like working in that space at the moment? Johannes. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, this is a tough one. Um, I think it's so enjoyable working on periodicals because I think that not only is it, you know, you revisit it, you know, and you can create sort of parameters design-wise that can evolve and, but also, you know, help you guide through the sort of subsequent issues. I think um, it's also a really nice platform to collaborate with, you know, amazing artists or illustrators or photographers and to be able to commission them is so, is so fun. I think in the, um, in the recent years we've done, I mean, Flaneur being one, um, then we do also Sofa, is another self-initiated magazine as well that is kind of aimed more at Gen Z and a bit more of a younger audience. And I think like having these sort of self-initiated projects really help us also, you know, flex those sort of design muscles and just try new things out and be a little bit more bashful and, you know, yeah. But um, so lately we've we've done less indie magazines. We've sort of focused more on working um, with um, bigger corporations, I guess. We've sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Startups. No, so we've just done, a, um, a, I guess, a, the equivalent, a DoorDash, it's called. It's uh, the US equivalent of Just Eats. That they do also a magazine, and they've given us so much freedom to do whatever we want, and also, um, you know, given us actually budgets that the broadsheets or the daily, the traditional type of media won't have for illustrators to com to commission. Or we just did a book, which is also hopefully going to be a serial um, publication for Hinge, which is a, sort of a shape of a of a phone. It's a phone book essentially, <laughs> where we work with some incredible illustrators, and it was so fun to be, yeah, to kind of basically co connect with everyone and create this big network of, of creatives, and yeah. But I wanna uh, shout out to Keir, if they're here, who worked on both those projects with us. It's a London-based freelancer. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought the, the phone book but, uh, from Hinge was, was fantastic. It was so good to see. Um, I think the, the magazine you're talking about there was Secret Menu, right, with, um, with DoorDash. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about that, actually, because it is a food magazine. If you go to, you know, the airport, WH Smith's or anywhere, there's a lot of food magazines out there, right? Like, it's a saturated space. Some of them don't look that great. A lot of them look pretty terrible. I guess, how did you approach that, you know, how did you approach creating a really great, sumptuous um, food magazine and getting it to stand out? Because I think it is just, yeah, it looks amazing. It looks so different to what else is out there. Just eat. <laughs> loads of order, loads of food oh, in. Sorry. Don't leave your computer, just eat, 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 eat. work. So, no, like, no, cooking sure. and designing are really similar 
things to do, right? You, you have like yummy ingredients, like typography, like illustration, you know, and it's just about how you combine those things. And I think that's it sort of, we approached it with that spirit. I mean, the, the, the restaurants that they're profiling are like really local businesses and it's all about sort of um, uh, what local businesses do for the neighborhoods. Um, and so it has this sort of scrappy kind of attitude, you know, and I think we sort of approach it with a similar vibe of like just throw all the ingredients in and stir it around. You know? That is a great analogy for design. I love it. Yeah, no, it's, it's like cooking. I've never thought of it that way. But yeah, it's, it's so, so true. Um, I also wanted, I mean, you mentioned, Johannes, you mentioned Sofa Magazine. That was one that you designed, I think, in collaboration with a kind of 16-year-old who you met through Instagram. Is that right? Or found through Instagram? Did that yeah. sound a bit weird? That sounded weird. <laughs> that sounded so creepy. Yes. I apologize. I'd like to say our ed editor-in-chiefs. Ricardo and Kaya yeah. scouted them. I didn't. Yeah. I, I, I never <laughs> You're not had stalking. any relationship <laughs> with that woman. <laughs> oh my god! That's my we... fault. I'm, I apologise. Uh, that was that was your question. It was a badly yeah. worded question. But yeah, that was a kind of interesting collaboration, right, with someone who's not that, I guess, like experienced in the design world. I mean, they were um, they were doing this sort of editorial content. That's where they were collaborating on. Um, I know it looks like it's been designed by 16-year-old persons. <laughs> um, that was really, yeah, that was really fantastic. They um, brought their friends into sort of like uh, group chats to discuss the themes and what they thought um, would be interesting to talk about. And um, we scouted the girl for the cover. Um, she was amazing and yeah, had loads of power. And, yeah. Um, I do want to, I mean, I guess we've sp spoken a lot there about print, and I want to kind of come on to some, some, other, some other projects. Um, you recently completed the identity for the House der Kulturen der Welt, I'm going to try and say that in German, yes. um, House of World Cultures, which yes. is in, in Berlin. I think we've seen it actually behind us on, on yes. the screen. Um, I guess it kind of put this idea of co-creation or like put co-creation at the heart of, of the design. Can you talk us through that project? Because, um, yeah, it's got a really interesting story behind it. Yeah. So now I need to shout out Sandy Biaya, who's in the audience, who did that with us as well. <laughs> um, I, that, was, that was fantastic. That was a pitch, and normally we don't like pitches, but Hakavit is just such a legendary institute in Berlin, and um, it's a, close to our hearts because we had already done quite a bit of stuff with them. Like, we had the Flano Festival the, for, for the Taipei issue uh, there, and uh, we've worked with their literature department and things, so it was a pitch that we couldn't turn down. Um, when the new director, Bonaventura and Kong came on, he really wanted to sort of open it up. It's not the house, de, the house of cultures of the world, but the house of cultures of the world, you know, with this idea of um, there's not just one world, there's not just one experience, you know, there's, there's many experience, many worlds. It's a pluriverse, like, sort of moving away from the universe. So this was sort of the brief. Um, and I mean, he's built like an incredible team from around the world and they've all bought knowledge from around the world. And um, we had to somehow reflect this in an identity that's quite simple and quite uh, recognizable. And also the previous identity Berlin loved and it's amazing and it was super strong. So it was like, yeah. <laughs> totally nerve wracking. Terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying, <laughs> really easy. Um, I mean, we started, I guess, quite in a formalistic way, like really thinking about the actual building, the actual location. It's in Tiergarten. Tiergarten's an amazing, huge park, you know, in Berlin. And we've had done a book about it previously with architects, so we know a bit about it. And it's, it's like um, its own biotope. Uh, so it's got its own microclimate, and it's, um, it's like two degrees colder normally. So it's a really special place. And, you know, when we're talking about the world as well, we have to include the natural world. So we were sort of playing with these organic forms also because of the roof shape. It's got this winged roof, which originally was supposed to be butterfly wings, I think, sort of freedom of, uh, inf uh, sort of about freedom of uh, information, things like this. Right. Um, so we had these forms, but it didn't feel like it was hitting their values or their goals, you know? Um, and this is also maybe where collaboration comes in a bit. We, 
we gave it to Yun, who, uh, someone who was working with us, who's like a generative designer. And she started making move with gesture or with language or sound, or, you know, other ways of communicating um, other than just, you know, our, us designers drawing and just experimenting with how does it feel when it moves. And it was just, there was one area that was so beautiful when these lines cross over and kind of like spaces open up, you know? And we just, it, sort of intuitively felt that's a really nice kind of metaphor for like, you know, spaces of information or intersections of knowledge sort of like opening up. And I think ultimately, I thought it'd be so nice if it just wasn't any more recognized as these letters HKW, which was so strong before, you know, but eventually recognizable as just some woozly shapes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can read that. That's I mean, it, nice. is, it yeah. is fantastic. I'm sure it will come up again um, behind us on the screens. But yeah, it's such a great. I mean, did you have anything to add, Janis, to that to that project? Or yeah, with H, uh, with how how yeah. to an No, I mean, yeah, I think I, you said sort of everything there is to <laughs> say. But I think the the fact of um, deconstructing these letter forms was something that suddenly there was something happening in the project that was really getting really interesting. And I think also sort of in a, I, I mean, you have to be really careful framing this, but like obviously the, you know, there's always this Western point of view on the cultures of the world, you know, like it being a Western um, or a, an institution based in Berlin, it's there essentially, even though with their international team, obviously they're trying to sort of like put a stance against it, but it's still a Western sort of take on, um, on the cultures of the world, which is kind of a slightly problematic um, maybe viewpoint or vantage point. Um, so I, we felt also that um, breaking up these sort of Latin, um, um, the Latin letter forms um, was really interesting that they just became these shapes. Um, and the fact that obviously through movement and speech, like you said, they, they became something else. Um, so sort of also tapping into this idea of, you know, what is knowledge and how does knowledge get sort of passed on, not just via the written, written text. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, it's a really, it's a nice project. And I think it's c it continues to grow as, a, as, as it's like a, um, you know, there's, I think there's about 10 exhibitions per year. So we get to work on, on it continuously. And yeah, we just kind of started last year. So we're looking forward to how it continues to grow. And just a note on that co-creation thing. I mean, that came from them. That's quite interesting. They uh, decided to hire a different agency for the identity, for the publications, and for the digital stuff. Mm, okay. So I thought that's actually quite nice, because you usually have one agency that does everything. But I already, somehow, like, intrinsically, you know, from the start, there was this, like, we're all going to have to work together and, you know, give up some of our design to someone else. And, yeah. Interesting, yeah, that's not that usual in the kind of territorial world of, of design, is it? No, but again, it's that idea of like, you know, giving up sometimes a bit of your vision, you know, to allow space for other people's can, some, you know, really nice things can happen. So. Fantastic. Um, sorry, did you have No, something? no, but I think it's also, I think during the last few years, I think we've learned also by having a larger team, um, I think this sort of idea of post-ownership within the team and with also sort of allowing other design studios to work with our, our logo. <laughs> See what I did there? Uh, no, but I mean, with that, with this logo, like I, I think it's really nice not to be too um, uh, sort of like precious. precious. Yeah, exactly, with, with the work. I think it's, it's opens up and it's really interesting when other people work with it um, to see what comes out of it. Definitely, that's a lovely note uh, to end on. I think we want to get, get some kind of quick fire audience questions, if that's all right. Um, I think we touched on this already, but yeah, Charlene asks, what's the secret for a CV to be recognized by a design studio? So um, I don't know if you have anything to add other than don't over-design it, <laughs> put it in a PDF. Is that, is that pretty much it? <laughs> <laughs> Say something nice. I mean, I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's a joke, it's just a joke. Get the names right and don't write, dear sir, madam. I can, I can, honestly, I can write a rule book for applying for jobs. Fair. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll move on. Um, Jacob asks, what strategies do you use to attract new clients? And I guess you don't, you maybe haven't done this much recently, but you said, you know, in the earlier days, you maybe did have some strategies for attracting new clients. Is that one for you, Johannes? 
Michelle is nodding at you, so. Oh, that's I, don't <laughs> I don't think we ever had like a sort of like a rule or strategies. I think we always. Um, I don't know. I think we just. Oh, I think we did. What did we do? I think. We <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. I, no, I mean, we were. Yeah, yeah, we worked hard. We, uh, we, but, so we, we're together, so when we, went, when we went on holiday, we'd take our portfolio and literally go door-to-door -to, -door to agencies. You That's know. not true. Oh, my God. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I don't know what you were doing. You were, you were by the pool. On holiday? You were by the pool, yeah. That sounds like a shit holiday, <laughs> mate. No, no, when you way, go, I'm when not, you go like, away, wherever you go. When we went to LA, Amsterdam. Okay, once, man. Amsterdam. Once. <laughs> Twice. 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 I did say I'd have to maybe break you up at some point today, <laughs> you know, to, yeah, to stop the fist We thought this was going to be some <laughs> therapy, not... Um, it's unbearable. Okay, so when you go on holiday, take your portfolio and hand it round to... No, people. don't do that. That is such a <laughs> shit advice. <laughs> no. <laughs> Doesn't sound like much That's of a bad advice. Well, yeah, we that did, is bad advice. We did do a little bit of, like, yeah, um, cold calling. We did, actually. Um, and, and yeah, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, it didn't ever lead us anywhere. It led us, it led us to Secret Menu magazine four years later. Oh, shit, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, okay. <laughs> this is kind of amazing to watch live, to be honest. I'm uh, really enjoying it. Um, Here's a question from Zai. How do you navigate creative differences when working in a team? Um, what differences? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe is that too sore a point right now? Yeah, no. How do you, how do you kind of navigate creative yeah, differences, how, how either you? between yourselves or, you know, w within a team? I mean, that's an interesting one because we do all have quite a strong, quite strong style and quite a strong vision and taste. Um, I'm really nice, by the way. <laughs> the most differences come between us. Yeah. Um, I think we try and allow, is it stalking? <laughs> I think we try and allow everyone to have really room to do their thing, you know? Um, and sometimes there is a discussion about, uh, you know, should we put this route forward? Should we not? Is it to this? Is it to that? But I think at the end of the day, if one of the designers really believes in it, we'll do it anyway, you know? And I think, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, kind of giving people space to, yeah. Yeah, I guess, make the case. Okay. Yeah, to make the mistakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Johannes, this last question is from Liam. Um, what intended change or influence on the world would you like your work to create? Just a small one to, to finish off with. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, it's just design. It doesn't, you can't change the world, guys. <laughs> no, I do Have believe, a laugh. No, come on. I, yeah. I do believe in, in the power of, like, I mean, it's not just design. Obviously, we also work in um, sort of the wider field of communication. And I, obviously, that's, that helps transport certain ideals. And, um, but I think that, um, yeah, I don't know. What was the, the question, question again? <laughs> Uh, what would you like your intended uh, influence on the world to be through your work? Whoa. Something like that. Sorry, Liam, I might have slightly paraphrased it there. Spread more joy. <laughs> spread more joy. Yeah, yeah spread more joy. Oh. Yeah. Okay, spread more joy. That's yeah. very nice. I would, I would, that's, you're, you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, I guess like one final, final question from, from me. Um, obviously, like... A lot of your work, I think it's fair to say, is kind of, yeah, on the more experimental side, as we've said. It's not so much on the kind of classic side. Um, how do you go about kind of keeping your ideas fresh, keeping your inspiration? Like, you know, people obviously have challenges with, you know, motivation, inspiration a lot. What do you do to kind of make sure that you and your team are feeling kind of, yeah, their ideas are fresh, you feel inspired, that you can bring that kind of experimental side of things to, to your work? <laughs> nice question. I think it's about just keeping a mix. I mean, I think what does make us a bit special is that we sort of move between corporate, uh, cultural, and indie projects mm. quite a lot. And I think that balance keeps us inspired, you know? Mm. We're not doing the same thing over and over again, and we can bring what we learn from some projects into others. And 
It means that, I mean, when we do indie projects, we're doing them with like a lot of local Berlin artists, people we really respect, you know, like organizations like Climate Care or Queen Cake or like a experimental club commission, you know, things like this and that. Just working with people you really admire is mm -hmm. always inspiring, you know. Um, yeah, just staying curious. <laughs> yeah. I think also being sort of in discussion and just continuous learning. Um, I think, you know, just meeting all these different people um, is something that's just really inspiring, but also not just being sort of preset on ideas, you know, just sort of like, I think maybe that's also something that I said earlier, but like kind of to stay vulnerable and to kind of not pretend that you know everything, but like just to kind of, yeah, keep learning. That's, that's a lovely, yeah, I think it's, we've kind of come full circle there and come back to curiosity and learning and, and being vulnerable, which are all very valuable lessons for all of us, I think. Um, we will have to leave it there. Michelle, Johannes, thank you very, very much. Everyone give a round of applause for Studio Yukiko. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.